Join us on the Swim Monkey. Swim. Swim Monkey. Swim Monkey. Swim Monkey TV. On the Monkey. Blocks into a two-day practice. Butterfly kicks and the hardest sport there is. Racing starts and don't breathe off the wall if you want to make it to Olympic team at all. Flip, turn, streamline, Florida swimming. Under the flags and dry land training. Long course season and Caleb Dressel. Short course season, Elizabeth Beisel. Tune in now to the Swimmer Joe Show. So hello, everybody. And Sid, we are here for another Coach's Happy Hour. So pumped for you guys. We've had so many great shows the last few weeks with uh, Stories with Sid and, and the Happy Hour and all the shows on the network. So we're so pumped for that. But Sid, how's well, it going down there, bud? Here we are, middle of July, Joe. Who'd have thunk it? You know, we're actually closer to August now than we are to June. And uh, tonight, I mean, I I'm excited because we've got a couple guys who have made their home in South Florida. And, and these are guys we get to see, but they are both international stars and, and have, have certainly come to us, you know, by way of, of the first of, from Cincinnati, Ohio, and I, I guess uh, the great state of Indiana, and, and then the second by way of Poland and Arizona, but now right here in Fort Lauderdale. So I think we're we Okay, go oh, ahead. I, I, I can't wait because, you know, we've, we've had this 68 and 72, like, era the last the last two or three weeks on the network, and it's been awesome. And now we still – we have another one that – another great one. Um, and then also – 92. Well, I know. I know. We – I know. I'm, I'm so pumped because we're the same age, Marius and I. But anyway, listen. Before we get to that, I want to talk about really quickly about the state of Florida. They're having a lot of uh, meetings, uh, school board meetings, things like that, where – uh, they are voting and having nine and 10 hour meetings and then they vote for what school is doing. Um, so we know that Seminole County is delaying their start to, start of school by a week. Now, I guess it's to prepare for um, COVID things in the classroom, uh, but they are delaying it by a week. We haven't heard from FHSAA. I know that Sid, that you have a, have a in there. Well, I've just um, been watching. They, they, Joe, the FHSAA is going to have an emergency board meeting on Monday. And um, now they had voted unanimously to shove it back from the committee to August 10th, but still to have the same championship dates for all the fall sports. That was just a committee recommendation. So this is the full board, and I imagine it's going to be a heck of a meeting. Starts at 5 p.m. Supposed to be open to the public, so you can go and ask for request to be admitted to that meeting, as I understand it. I don't know for certain, but I believe it is open. I, I think, I mean, it's crazy. A huge meeting down here with the public schools. We're private, so we're waiting. I know it's just nobody really knows. Yet. The further we get into this muck, it's the more it's like, you know, I, I keep reading and reading and reading this and that's and this and down this rabbit hole. And I, Joe, let's just have some fun tonight. Let's not get too COVID ca caught up. Hey, we just, we had to do our, our you know, our, our, two, our, 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 okay. our minute diligence. COVID. Now it's time to have a little bit of fun. And guess who we have? Guess who we have? Said so we have amazing athletes, amazing coaches, amazing men tonight. I'm so pumped to have Gary Hall Sr., the very 68. first USA swimmer to ever carry the flag in the Olympic Games. I, I knew he was the first. 68, 72, 76 Olympics. Held the flag, walked everybody in, okay? Also, um, five-time world record holder, oh, broke man. it 10 times. By himself at Indiana, scored 56 and a half points. By himself. He himself <laughs> beat the majority of the schools, okay, for Indiana, all right? So you guys hear about Mark Spitz. He is equally no. as fast as Not equal. No. Gary was if you're if you're picking a team and you had yes. all the Indiana guys and all the Southern Cal guys and you're gonna go, okay, I'm gonna pick an all-star team. I got first pick, I'm taking Gary Hall. Yes. <laughs> I mean, what, be, Mark, beyond I anything. Like that. <laughs> no, and, and and even after listen, even after swimming, uh, uh, Coach Gary Hall now is uh, unbelievable stuff. Is, Gary, tell us, tell us where you're coming from and what's going on briefly in your life. You know, I love what I do. I love being a coach. I love swimming. Gosh, it's a, I mean, uh, I'm almost as passionate about the sport as you and Joe are, but uh, not quite. Mm -hmm. Anyway, no, I, I have to start good. out by saying I, on Monday I was I watched your show on Monday. I saw three of the greatest distance swimmers in history. Not only that, 
Brian Goodell, uh, Mike Burton, John Kinsella, three of the mentally toughest swimmers of all time. And what a great yeah. show that was. I really enjoyed that one. But uh, and if anybody you know, it, they can get the replay at Swim Month. Yeah, watch it. It's <laughs> worth it. Those three guys are legendary, just legendary. It was yeah. it was crazy that we had to yeah. shut it off after an hour because we could have gone for two or three more hours and just Easy. talked about Easy. we'll bring yeah. we'll bring them back on different days. But Gary, tell us where you're coming from. I am in beautiful Coronado, California, although I claim to be a Floridian. Uh, I've been spending more time out here in, in Coronado right now. I'm kind of glad that I'm here and not in Southern Florida. Right. No offense, but man, it is beautiful here. That's why I'm outside. You see me out on my patio. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be seeing me here like this in Florida right now. But uh, uh, I love the Keys. I love Florida. Uh, but I've been out here just trying to build this side of the country's business. It's kind of full circle. For me, you mentioned Cincinnati and Indiana, but you forgot before that. And I, I started in California. That's right. And uh, and I ended up, you know, I'm almost like going full circle here. But I'm leaving next week. I'm going back down to Florida. Gary Jr. is going to be down there with me for uh, two weeks with his with his kids, my grandkids. And uh, we're going to try to teach uh, Charlie, his his son, how to spearfish. And, and he's a killer. But, oh, my gosh, I'm, I'm looking at this kid and his like Gary, his, his, his hands, his, his fingers touch the ground when he's standing up. I mean, his arms are that long. And he's only oh my 12. Gosh, that's awesome. He's 12. He's probably going to be 6'10". I'm thinking, this guy's got to swim. we got to get this you gotta guy. you got to get him in the water. you got to get him in the water. Somehow, we're going to get this guy in the water. Hey, speaking of 6'10", 6'10", guess who we got on our show tonight? We have another all-star, Sid. We have. He's a tall drink of water, but six ten. I don't know. No, I know he's not six ten. I'm just saying. And speaking of height, you know, up there, pretty good. Mariusz Podkachelny. I'm I'm pretty close. I think I was better in the intro early on, but you did good. I, you did good. So Mariusz here, outstanding distance swimmer in his own right for sure. Went to a couple of Olympic games, senior national qualifier for his country, our, our champion for his country, junior champion for country. A national champion for the United States. Uh, NCAA and NCAA Olympic, Olympic record holder. Dude goes to his first Olympics and uh, he's hoping to make the top eight and ends up top qualifier beating Woe Dad and all the people that were supposed to be better than him. Was and I got to hear that story, by the way. I got to hear we'll that get story. To it. We'll been, get to it. Mario you must have been know. crazy nervous on that one. For and sure. doing a great job since he took over as head coach of Pinecrest uh, down here in Fort Lauderdale. Far. Welcome, Marius. Tell us what's happening in your life. Uh, well, we're sitting okay, down here in South Florida. Um, got a little bit of taste of fun about three weeks ago. Four weeks ago, we opened up for about a week and a half. And things started going crazy down here again. And um, um, we're sitting on the sideline. Everybody's kind of getting into city pools. Uh, I'm trying to take care of my daughter, um, you know, find her pool time and you know, keeping her time organized. Uh, just like thousands of, you know, of parents, swim parents around the state and the country. Well, I, you know, I, I, it's, it's crazy and we're lucky. We have a, a nice little pod in Orlando where there's some pools open. The um, you in the bubble, Joe? We are in a bubble. You're like, <laughs> like the NBA. It's you in the NBA, right? The, the NBA is down the street and I don't even know how they're doing that. That's crazy. But um, I don't know how they're doing that. Cause it's, it's, well, it is actually huge out there, but it's still there's still a lot of people around, so it's yeah. it's crazy. But the right, so teams in Orlando, you're having fun at least. And Marius, we're using the beach a lot. Gary, I'm sure they're surfing out there, right? The beaches are open. Beaches are open. You know, it's crowded. It was Fourth of July. You couldn't find a place to sit in the sand. I don't know about social distancing, <laughs> because there wasn't any place to distance too. I mean, you literally, it's like, oh my god, I can't. It was crazy, uh, but you know, it's uh, like you said. I don't know. You never know. You just can't know who to believe or what to believe in all this in this madness. But uh, um, you know, we're going to get through it. We're, we'll be through it, and soon, I hope. And, uh, and and that's what we have is positive messages, Joe. Right? We we have a classic. The, the, with Mari, you well, starting his. T tell us well, about. Listen, that. we have we have we have positive messages with Mario. We have positive stuff with uh, Gary Hall, of course. All of you guys are positive, so this is a very positive show. But we are going to talk about Mariusz's How many days have you been writing something? 
Um, going on 120, I didn't start immediately, but um, you know, I'm not a huge Facebook person. I, I, you know, I randomly check things, but I stopped watching the news after about a week of being uh, uh, shut down, uh, uh, just because there was so much negative stuff coming out, so much scary stuff, and then all of it was being repeated on Facebook. So I kind of said, you know, I'm, I'm just going to come up with something that that be a new. I'm not going to listen to all the negative. Stuff. Every day I'm going to come up with something that I didn't know before. I used to teach history at Pinecrest, um, so I love the kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, looking at something that uh, we all had a lot of time on our hands, I'm going to put my time to work in a way that's going to be a little more um, thoughtful than all the stuff that we were getting uh, uh, because of the of the shutdown that, that lasted for almost three months, and technically we're still in it. So going on twenty. So give us give us a couple of your favorite things that you did not know that you researched and found out. All right. You guys heard about a guy named Dean who ran 50 marathons in 50 days in Whoa. 50 days. Oh, my uh, gosh. You know, it's amazing. The guy is an animal distance runner. He goes like you and I will go for a four or five mile jog. He goes for a 30 mile jog. And that's <laughs> wild for him. Yeah. Uh, an amazing athlete, but really, the, and it was one of the first ones that I did. And growing up in Poland, uh, you know, obviously the communist countries glorified their heroes. Emil Zatopek, who was a distance runner in a 50. Yeah. Um, but the reason why that story really stuck with me is he won the first gold medal coming from behind. And the only reason he won, there's such a great lesson for a lot of young swimmers. Trust the process. Trust your coaches. They have your best interest in mind. So what the guy, his coach told him, he was not allowed to be uh, 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 in a stadium. He was in a stance. He told him, listen, this is the pace you have to hold. Don't worry. It was a 5K and 10K. Don't worry about anything else, what other people do. I'm going to be giving you signals every lap. you on, you too slow, you too fast. And we're going to just stick to our plan. And after two laps, the guy is like 100 yards behind the leaders. And everybody is looking, what is going on? And lap after lap after lap, what he trained for, what he decided with his coach, he wins a gold medal. Not only wow. that, I know the rules were different. He ended up winning five, five, uh, 5K, 10K, and last minute entered the marathon at the end of the Yeah, I remember. It's an amazing story. And, they, they, you know, the kind yeah. of stuff that – I think every young athlete, every athlete should know. I mean, we know our swimming stars, so we know our swimming stories, but there's just so much more out there that's very inspirational. I don't think he'd ever run a marathon before either. I, I think he went and went and just here, enter it, and, yeah. and yeah, he went. I mean, that was an amazing story. I remember oh, reading yeah, there, there, There's a great Olympic, you know, all those Bud Greed spans, and, and certainly they've done them on you, Gary, and I'm sure you're in some, Mariusz, but that there's one on, on Emil that you, I highly recommend. And speaking, it kind of, I, I like that Dave Waddle, though. I, you remember that one, Gary, right? When it comes yeah. from, from behind. So tell me, Mariusz, let's, let's start with your story first about your first Olympics you know, you were coming up in the ranks. You'd been like a junior national champ in Poland. Walk us through exactly what kind of emotions it is to make the Olympic team. And, and then when you get there, what, what transpired in your first games, which were in Seoul, correct? Correct. So the, the, the process is a little different in Poland. You don't have Olympic trials. Things right now so resembles kind of like Olympic trials, but we have simple time. What they will tell us is they look at the previous year top 12 in the world and the top 12 time was to, you know the time cut to go to olympics and i moved to mission viejo in 87 um try to make something of myself uh, in the swimming world because um opportunity came up and very quickly i you know after a year i broke the top 10 in the world so i made the olympic team so my trip to olympics was fairly easy because i didn't have to stress I knew I was going at the beginning of the eight. So all I had to do is to focus on training. And I did. But still, you know, I trained with Artur, who in the March of 88 breaks the world record. Um, he goes 347 in Orlando. Um, I went 351, which was my best time by three seconds. And I'm on cloud nine. 
But 351, you know, doesn't do anything at the Olympics. I knew that. So going into the Olympics, I wanted to make the final. That was my goal. I wanted to be a top eight. I wanted to walk out. I wanted to be able to have my name being introduced behind the blocks. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, as cheesy as it sounds, I made a tank top. Um, uh, when I was in Mission Viejo, I made a tank top that said 348 dot, 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 anything. And I'll be happy with that. <laughs> and I swim in lane two um, in, in a pretty loaded heat. I was in seated heat. And at the 200 mark, I, I noticed that I'm right there in the, uh, in the midst of it, and I still got something left. So I put pressure on it, and I touched the wall. And I just remembered that the only thing that mattered to me at that time was that I won the seated heat. Short of you know, something going terribly wrong, I knew I made a final. So my arms went up. I'm excited. I didn't even look at the scoreboard which started flashing Olympic record. So I'm getting out of bed. I'm <laughs> uh, my, my coach, Terry Stoddard, is yelling in a scream, where to go, Mariusz? And I'm walking out at the person that was uh, uh, timing behind the blocks, like, shakes me up and puts me in it. He goes, look what you just did. Do you know that? I look at it. I go, new Olymp I, I, I was just, you know, this was like an icing on a cake. But that's when the scary stuff happened because I was always in a shadow of Artur. So Artur was the guy that took all the uh, uh, media attention from, from us. You know, I was just kind of a, uh, there for a ride. And I'm walking out of the facilities and, you know, I've got cameras in my face. I don't know what is going on. I don't know, I don't know why this is going on. I want to go back to, the, uh, to our, our, our room and rest. And the world turned upside down. I go to the pool for finals. I'm warming up and cameras are in your face. You know, what, what's going on? So, um, you know. Were, we, were you able, Mariusz, were you able to rest the way you wanted to between prelims and finals? What was that like? <laughs> All right, Sid. So th there is a story. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no. Short I, answer. <laughs> you can write books about what we didn't know then or didn't care. I, you know, as far as I remember, I played cards in between prelims and finals. I never, ever take naps. Um, so I wasn't resting in between. I, you know, I was just killing time, trying to keep my mind on something else, doing everything except laying flat and resting. So, but, you know, those are the days. <laughs> those are the days. Well, what are you guys so thinking about? Because you guys had those... You know, the scary look on your face. What were you thinking I was doing? Yeah, he was he was on the block just going, oh, my God, I can't believe I, 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 everything's looking at me. I, I want to know what when you were standing on the block. Yeah, final. And, you, and, you, let's, let's and you're it. in the finals and you're going, you know, I hope I don't, you know, do something crazy on the block here because I'm nervous as can be. I mean, what what was that like before? You know, every every swimmer knows it. Right. It's the it's the when you get on the blocks and you kind of zone out. Right. Everybody's zoned out. And then they I get on the block. Joe, every swimmer knows it at the junior Olympic level or the dual <laughs> meet. Or, now, Mariusz has experienced it in his first Olympics as the new Olympic record holder. And, and the guy who's the big stud has got to be, what, he's in lane five and you're in four. And then the German guys are over there. They're, they're unbelievable. Yeah, I, was, I was next to, uh, on one side, I had Arturo on one side and then I had Uwe Dassler on the other side. Um, so, you know, I was more nervous in the morning. You know, all honesty, for me, the pressure was off um, because I made a final. Um, true, uh, true. You know, getting up on the block, anything more was just about racing. And I, I, I put in the work. I, you know, I look back and uh, leading up into ADD Olympics was the best work that I've done ever. Um, Terry prepared me tremendously, both physically and mentally. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I was not scared of competition. I, I knew what Artur is going to do. Um, you know, um, I didn't know what I was going to do, which was a nice thing because I surprised myself in the morning. Um, and I've raced against other guys. I, pretty much every person in that heat, I've raced them at one point or the other. So we were all, you know, old buddies. And, you know, so he wasn't scary in the finals. Prelims, absolutely. So, you know, and, and when you're swimming, and, I, and I'm, I'm sure Gary knows this as well with all the guys that he was swimming with, but <clears throat> you know everybody's strengths, right? Like yeah. 400 I am, Gary would know, okay, like uh, I'm going to be way in front after the backstroke, right? I'm going to be like, and then so, so Mariusz, when you were swimming, um, 
you're free. You're like, okay, this guy's got a pretty good hundred at the end. So I've got to be a body length up, up on him or something. Right. I mean, so how was that going for you in the Olympics in the final? Cause you did lower your time. Yes. So, so how uh, was that? So, you know, the first thing, uh, you know, normally <laughs> swimming with Anders, the, the goal was don't, don't try to race Anders in the first 150 because he just takes off like crazy. Uh, but I was blocked off, so I didn't even see him because I think he was in lane eight or one. Um, but uh, uh, I've always raced Artur, so I knew that I need to be in front of him. Um, and, and I think everybody was, you know, we were all surprised um, how the middle of the field uh, uh, kind of stayed back initially. Uh, uh, Matt was up there, you know, at the beginning, uh, uh, Duncan Armstrong and stuff. Um, uh, but it was Uber really that came back from, the, from, the, from behind at the end and, uh, and shocked us all. Um, I was not where I wanted to be in a race at the 300 mark to play into my strengths. But at the same time, um, I knew the field was going much faster than we did in the morning. So I, I was pumped, excited. You know, it was funny. You mentioned Duncan Armstrong. And I, and I said this on like four, four shows ago, Sid. Um, Duncan Armstrong, when he got interviewed, when he beat um, – uh, who's the, who was the guy in the two hundred free? Matt, when he rode the uh, wave off, yeah, right, yeah I, I just Beyondi hopped in the two hundred free, right? Beyond me, yeah. He goes, I yeah. just hopped in the trop and body surfed in. I thought that was the greatest line ever. <laughs> <I'm> well, <laughs> he was small enough, but Marius, that was a great final. You ended up with the fifth place. You guys were all so close. I remember watching that, and then you got to go back again four years later. We'll get back to that one. I mean, it's unbelievable. And, and you take that experience and now sharing it with youngsters. Gary, you were at three Olympics, okay? And and your first one versus the last one, I, I brought up that you marched in with the flag. I mean, by the time you got to Montreal in 76, and, and that was the trials I swam in, and my dad had gotten a place in Montreal we, we, and in hopes that I might make it, but I guess saw my roommate. I saw all your races in Montreal. It was great. And, of course, watched everything live. In, well, we thought was live. You know, it was live for the East Coast in 72. But then the 68 games, we only read about them in Swimming World. We really didn't see them as much. What did you see in those three different Olympics? What changed? And and as we look at it, those that's a golden age. When you look at 68 right through 76, those three Olympics, how much the sport and the culture changed? Because you were there in 68. The guys are putting their fist up and all that stuff. Tell tell us what your life was like as an Olympian. Amazing. And those three Olympics were so different. I mean, it's amazing the transformation of the Olympics. Of course, 72 had the Palestinian-Israeli slaughter, which was horrible, horrible. It changed the Olympics forever. But before that, I mean, you could walk into the Olympic Village with a pair of Adidas on because they thought you were an athlete. It was really open. And uh, uh, you know, you talk about being, you know, the underdog, Mariusz, in, in Seoul. And I was, uh, you know, 16. There were a lot of young guys on that 68 team. In fact, John Kinsella was the youngest guy. He was 15 making that team. And uh, I had, like, no expectations at all, which is really kind of a great place to be. Um, two years before, a year and a half before the Olympic trials in 1968, I was ready to quit swimming. I mean, I was down and out. And I got tutored and helped by a guy named John Urbanchek, who was just starting out in his career and turned out to be a pretty good coach. Um, he mentored me along, and then I came under the – I wanted to actually swim for John. Um, and I tried to move one city over into Anaheim, where he was the coach, and, and the CIF, which was the high school equivalent in, you know, in California – uh, wouldn't permit me to, to go to school there. So I had to go back to where I had come. And uh, there was a new coach in town there, a guy named Flip Dar. And Flip, I didn't know from Adam, but uh, uh, Flip is now one of the Hall of Fame coaches and Coach Shirley and the Furness brothers and Steve Gregg and his list of great swimmers is lengthy. But Flip really took me from being nobody to the only I remember walking into his office the first day and he said, you know, I said, hey, Gary, nice to have you back. And I said, well, thanks. You know, I was trying to go away from the school. And I came back. He said, what do you want to do? I said, well, I don't know. I'm, you know, kind of lost. I'm, I'm looking for my way. He said, you want to make the Olympics? 
I said, yeah, sure, I'd li <laughs> Obviously, I'd love to. That's been my dream since I started. He said, well, then you're going to have to swim the 400 I am. I said, oh. really? <laughs> he said, yeah, that's the weakest stroke on the schedule. He said, nobody likes to swim that event. He said, you want to make it, you got to go to the lowest hanging fruit. I said, okay, but I can't swim breaststroke. And actually, I never could swim breaststroke. <laughs> and I'm, I'm part of the extinct breed of IMers that couldn't swim breaststroke. Yeah, they don't exist anymore. Really. You're right about that. They do not exist. Oh, man. But anyway, I, you know, I just, uh, uh, he, he really started training me for the 4IM. The um, I went to the, the trials, you know, really with no expectations, although I'd actually set the world record that summer. It was interesting, that record, that 4IM record was broken three times, four times, I think, that summer by Greg Guckingham. You know, he broke Dick Ross' record, then I broke it, then Charlie Hickox broke it. And then, and then uh, Greg Buckingham and, and Charlie and I ended up swimming in the Olympics. Uh, but, it, you know, it was, it was an amazing experience being there at 16. Um, you know, it was in, in history, those 68 Olympics were the social Olympics. And everybody remembers Tommy Smith, John Carlos, and the, and the gloves and everything. Uh, there were lots of issues going on in those Olympics. But to be a part of that was really, really something special. Well, you got you didn't just swim in it. You guys went a one-two sweep. I mean, weren't you only a, a few tenths behind Hickox? And, and you guys were teammates at Indiana, right? Not, not yet, but. Yeah, he was a, he was ahead. He had already graduated when I started. But we, um, yeah, Charlie, I, I'll never forget this. 400 IM is hard enough, right? But when you do it at 7,000 feet, that's just like. Oh, my God. That's like pouring torture. fuel on torture. The fire. That's torture. That's a hard event <laughs> anywhere. So I remember, you know, um, how wow. hard it was. It was really hurting. And, and Charlie and I were like stroke for stroke through the whole thing. We both had terrible breast strokes. Both <laughs> blew, we, t we totally blew our back to breast transitions. We both just completely annihilated. <laughs> if you look at it, and I don't even, I can't even find a video of that race anywhere. They didn't. Maybe I have to get to ABC, I guess, because no one seems to have a – my dad was filming it and dropped the camera in the last 100 to watch the race, so I didn't even get to see that. But I, I remember coming off the last wall, and it, and it was like, God, where is the finish of this race? And I looked over, and I'm breathing to the left, and Charlie's breathing to the right, and we're both just dying, right? And we see each other. It's like <laughs> he's looking at each other in the same breath. He's looking at me, and I'm looking at him. And I put my head back down, and I said – okay, I'm going to take one more stroke, and I don't care how bad this hurts. <laughs> I'm going for it. I'm going, to, I'm going to get to that wall first. So I take one more kind of lollygag stroke, and then I just I bear down, and I look up, and I see Charlie's suit. So he had done that one stroke before me, and I couldn't catch him. He was gone, and, and hey. uh, he, he, uh, he was an amazing swimmer, a great swimmer. Oh, yeah. How, how was it? How no was it? Yeah. How was it? I know we, we have more Olympics to talk about for you, but how was it training with all those guys around you? I mean, you had so many guys to race and train. How was that? You know, that was my first international meet. I'd never been, I'd never represented the United States. So here I'm thrown into this Olympic team and I was 16. My nickname was Clean Harold because I'd never been on a date. They called me Harry Gall instead of Gary Hall. And then I sort of got changed to Clean Harold. And I like, I, knew, I like it. Yeah, I'm not as clean <laughs> as I used to be. <laughs> you, need to make, Harry, Harry, you need to make shirts with that and put Harry the race Gaul. club on. I'm I telling you, that. that would be awesome. Yeah. And Doug, if Doug Russell and uh, who else was I room with? Kenny, um, who was the freestyler? Kenny Webb. Uh, not, yeah, Kenny Webb. And uh, there was a third guy. They were all like 24. They were the oldest guys. And I'm rooming with them. And I'm 16. And and man, they they just it was it was murderous. Uh, they were they were not uh, very forgiving. But uh, for whatever reason, I ended up in their room. Uh, but we had fun. It was fun. It was it was fun to be part of that team um, and learn. And it's just rubbing elbows with with guys. But uh, uh, it wasn't as exciting as the next two Olympics. The, and the last one being Montreal was by far to me the greatest team experience that I've had. And I had some great team experience. Indiana, four years, uh, you know, winning at every, every NC2As was a great team experience. But the, the 76 team topped it all. It was really a, a lesson in how important team 
is in this sport of swimming, you know, we think of this as an individual sport, but it's not. It's it's really a team sport. So, so Gary, what was it about the coaches on that staff? The men's coaches were – Doc was the head coach, right? Yeah, yeah. And you, did you have Don Gambrell? Don and George. And, John, George Haynes, Don yeah. Gambrell. You know, Doc Doc was a brilliant guy, and, and he did one of his – it was probably his most masterful bit of coaching in the 76 team. He took two – a team that was largely comprised of two teams, collegiate teams that had no love for each other. That was USC and Indiana. We were always battling USC for the championships. And, you know, and, and at the NC2As, the, the USC guys would come over and spit in our lane. And, you know, it was, it was ugly. It was, you know, everybody. So the fear was when you put these guys together, they're not going to make a very good team. Uh, but Doc, and I, I have to give a lot of credit to Steve Furness, who was a, co-captain who just he said look we're all sending our club teams and our nc2 our school teams shirts home we're not wearing them and and doc was all in on that he said yeah let's just wear team usa shirts we're all part of one team the other thing i'll tell you doc did which i thought was was brilliant he the first day he meets with the team he said you know the 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 committee whoever elects these olympic coaches whoever they were and he knew he were who they were he said you know not really important he said you got three coaches, and either any one of us could have been the head coach. It was I was just fortunate they 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 named me, but it really, you know, we're all we're all your head coach. He said I'm not going to be the head coach of this team. You got three head coaches. George is going to be a head coach. Don's going to be a head coach. I'm going to be a head coach. We're three co-head coaches. And I'll tell you what else we're going to do. I want you to train with whoever you want. We're, I'm not going to stand over all 24 of you guys and coach it for the next six weeks. You pick who you want to train with. Some of them knew George, some of them knew Don. I mean, I heard I heard uh, uh, Brian Goodell thank Don Gamble. Don Gamble was a great distance coach, and and he prepared Brian for the, one of the greatest athletic performances of all time. I, I like that. And, you know, they can go where they want to go, where they're more comfortable. They I, I like that. Pick, now, you Gary, to be, to be you fair, in 76, it was still pretty much – you know, men swimming in college, women hadn't started yet. And our women's team was more of a girls team. They were very young still, 68, 72, even younger probably, yeah. but 76 still young with everything that was going on with the East German doping, which obviously Shirley Babishoff and all the girls knew. <laughs> those, I know all those girls pretty well and have watched that. I, I'd love to get that the 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 relay members that are available on one year, one of these shows because – that that was such a fantastic thing for them, but they were experiencing something so different. Did Doc just that were what did you did you guys did you still mix with the girls when you got to the pool? Was it guys and girls two teams? How did that how did that affect everybody? Sid, now you know they were they were with the girls. I mean, come on. You know what? <laughs> uh, one of one of the great tragedies of of that Olympics was that they segregated. They really oh, segregated the men and the women, not just during the training camps. I mean, their training camp, we were in Canton, Ohio. I don't know. I don't even remember where they were, but they weren't anywhere close to us. Wow. So we didn't see them in training. Then we go to the Olympics. They're on one end of the Olympic fillers, and we're on the other end. And it was by design. Oh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a horrible thing. And they needed us. They really, really needed us. And we weren't there to put our arm around them and say, "You guys are going to be okay." You know, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna, you know, rise to it. And they did what they did on that last day was on their own. And Jack Nelson had a lot to do with that. I think Jack and Jim Montrell, who else was a coach on that? Women's Frank team? Frank Elm. Frank, Frank Elm. Elm. They did a brilliant job of 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 really getting their troops back and saying, "Look, this this we may have lost." you know, some battles here, but the war isn't over. And they came back on that last day. That's arguably the greatest athletic performance of all time. Of I, I, all time. I I would agree. I, I was in tears watching that. I mean, we were all, every, it was so emotional. And, and, and I really felt that Jack Nelson got a raw deal in, in the, in the, in the film. And, and I understand why they didn't want to, but they didn't talk about him. They didn't say anything about him. And, and I just think it was unfair because, from watching that, I mean, from being there, from knowing that everybody, certainly in hearing you say it, Gary, I appreciate it. It's just a shame that that um, that that those girls did not have more 
And yet I was glad to see when we had the 16 trials that certainly that film told a great deal of the story. I mean, it was powerful. It, it was exciting yeah. to watch. And I think it told it to another generation. But but so you guys were there having the greatest ever USA. And finally, the girls could join you. Did you get to party the last night together? Or what happened at the end? Yeah, I mean, we finally kind of got together and, and celebrated at the end. And we had a lot to celebrate about. It was everybody knew the East Germans were cheating. It was it was obvious. It was blatant. Since 74, 73, really, from Belgrade, 73 is when it became. You know, I mean, they went from nothing to also winning every event in Belgrade, first world championships. Next year, they wow. had that that dual meet. I don't know if you guys remember. In oh yeah, in Concord, and and the women were, t I mean, they were just they were huge, and and it was, uh, but you know, and then Shirley, I always felt because she was my teammate, and and killed me in practice. By the way, an amazing swimmer. <laughs> Uh, girls, was, the girls train, that's, that's what girls Brian said. He knew he had arrived when he could finally beat Shirley because she <laughs> was beaten. You know, and then you know that was a great story too. You know, and 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 you guys, you were swimming for Flip then, right? You and Bruce, yeah. Steve, Greg. You know, so Greg. She probably, had the, flu. She probably yeah. had the flu when uh, she probably had the flu when she got beat. Well, listen, Joe, your favorite beverage. Uh, it's time we we missed our half hour tribute, right. but. I'm I'm doing yeah. the beach patrol with my favorite beverage tonight, and uh, fellas, <laughs> um, I want to hear the last Olympics for you, Gary. Hold on, before you do that, before you do that, I want to also tell people that are watching from all the different platforms. If you would click the screen, you will be able to join the chat, the proper chat. If you want to ask these um, great coaches and athletes any questions, uh, please do so. But you do have to click the screen so you get on the right stream. Okay. Anyway, go ahead. So Gary, that 76 was unbelievable. And, and I think it was really where we came over. Um, so, so you did, you know, 72, we jumped over. We didn't really talk about, but the, the culture that, that when you see USA going from 68 in the Vietnam war to where we get, we're pulling out and then we get to 72 and we learn about terrorism. What, what lessons do you still carry today that you learned from those games? You know, and no one saw that coming. Uh, Seventy-two. That was a. That was just a total shock. Fortunately, the swing was over. We we had we missed it. it was by one day. They came in one day after the swing was over. In fact, we were scheduled to go to a uh, an exhibition swim in, in Regensburg, which is near Munich. And uh, I had spent the night outside the village. We were done, so I went to a hotel and and I was standing outside. And I came back. I got out of the subway and I see a line 20 deep all the way around the village. There were people lined up and I couldn't read the papers, you know, cause it was German and I was trying to figure out what was going on. And, you know, I, I, I there were armored tanks and, and police cars and sirens and, and all this stuff going on. And I finally worked my way. I had to force myself up to the entry to, to figure out how to get it, you know, to get back in. Cause I knew I was going to, I needed to be there to catch the buses to get on that, to go to the exhibition. And they wouldn't let me in. And, and I, you know, I finally, George Haynes walked by. There were very few people going by. Everybody was hunkered down in their room. And I still, I was there for an hour. I still had no idea what had happened. And I finally flagged George down. He came over and, and got, was able to get me in. He said, Gary, this is the end. It's, it's over. There's not going to be any more Olympics. What happened? He said, well, the you know, terrorists came in last night and killed a bunch of Israeli athletes. And they're up there in that room. He's pointing at like the building right next door. He said, they're up there right now. I said, are you kidding me? He said, no. He said, the Olympics are over. It's done. And I, I felt this, you know, this horrible sense of like, how did, how did this happen, you know? And and it did. It changed the the complexion uh, and and the safety and the just like nine eleven changed U.S. forever. Uh, you know, seventy two changed the Olympics forever. You know, you uh, guys have such a, a memory and a and a history that is amazing to to hear that. And um, sorry that you guys had to live through that. That's an awful time. Awful time, for sure. It was it was a sad it was a sad moment. I remember going back to the room. And Mark Spitz was in the room. We roomed together. 
So he's Jewish, you know, and, and they're fearing for his life, right? Right. So the FBI came in and took Mark out, put him in the trunk of the of a Mercedes Benz, and drove him to the airport and no put him way. on a plane to London to get him out of there. Wow. And, you know, his whole his whole room was just full of Western Union telegrams congratulating him. He didn't have time to open them. You so know, you were actually rooming with Mark while he is going and getting seven golds and seven world records. You're the roommate. So my job was to count the medals as they came. Who <laughs> 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 didn't confide in you at night? What was it? Wasn't it? What was it? The two hundred free? I guess the most challenging. Who do you have? Heidenreich or somebody else? He was oh worried. About. Uh, you know, it wasn't the two. It was the hundred free. It was 100. you know. We we actually swam against each other in the first day, the hundred, the two hundred fly, and and so we're rooming together, swimming against each other, and it was a little, you know, a little bit strange to be there. But you know, we'd done that all through college at every major NC two A's. You know, Mark and I roomed together, and we just got along. We, you know, we were we were good, and and Doc knew that I would not try to just get into Mark's head and destroy him like some others had done prior to that. And he, you could do that with Mark. He was a very suggestible kind of guy. So Doc always wanted me to be uh, Mark. And, and I'm not taking any credit at all for those seven gold medals, but I did set him up pretty well with the, I didn't have a chance to beat him. He was better than me, but, uh, and I swam uh, what I thought was, was the right race for me. And I ended up with silver. Uh, but, in the uh, the last day it was interesting because he had won six gold medals and I and I remember Sherm Shavor walked in his room, and I'm you know and it was kind of a divider but it was a, a folding thing that you know you could cut off if you wanted to, and so I could hear everything that Sherm was telling him, and I was sitting in there, he didn't know I was in there, and Mark didn't want to swim, the hunter free the last event. And and Sherm said, "Are you crazy? You nut! <laughs> what are you talking about?" He said, "Your favorite one, yeah, the world record. You, you, you're on a hot streak." And he said, "You know, I'd rather be six for six than go wow. six for seven." And and Sherm and I won't I won't repeat the words Sherm said to him, but it wasn't. <laughs> anyway, a lot of oh, no, that's no, no, no. that we probably know. Out of, and, you know, he basically just, you know, verbally slapped him in the face. He said, you're going to swim and you're going to win the Hunter Freedom All. And he got up and the crazy thing was, and uh, Jerry Heidenreich was a phenomenally talented swimmer. Those uh, who knew Jerry was, he probably was the one guy that had a chance of beating Spitz. But, uh, and he swam a great swim, but he got second. But, you know, Mark ended up swimming, winning, and, and the rest was history. Yeah, he, I, I think probably if he would have go, gone to two more Olympics like a Phelps or something, he would have had a lot more as well as you, Gary. I mean, uh, you know, we could have kept going, right? But I'm going to get back to Mariusz real quick. Mariusz um, had two Olympics, all right? And I know you've been watching us, Mariusz, for the last 10 minutes, and I apologize for that. But um, I want to talk about – <laughs> I want to talk about your, your your college, into getting into college and wanting to coach after that because um, – you know, it's kind of interesting, right? You you were at Arizona, and then what clicked and said, you know what? I want to coach. I want to be a coach. What was it in there that clicked that you said, you know, can I have an internship or can I be a fifth year coach? You know what? I, I I'm I'm going to proudly say that I, I'm the one that started the wave of coaches in Arizona that you know started coaching the fifth year. And you know, a little side story. Um, uh, Gary and I have another connection uh, because I coached Amy at our, in Arizona for a couple of years. That's right. My so, daughter. But I got to, I got to uh, uh, Arizona in January of 89 uh, because Olympics were so late. So I, I was going to be there for, for, for fifth year no matter what. Um, so uh, the only thing I kept thinking about for the four years during the spring break, when we had uh, NC2As during the uh, Christmas break when, you know, everybody was going home, all I kept thinking is I want to be a student. So I cleared my schedule. My classes were not starting any earlier than 10 a.m. And I was going to go literally, you know, go and be a college student, have fun. Um, and 
when the fifth year started, uh, that lasted probably about two or three weeks. Uh, and that was a big disappointment um, because I, I, overnight disconnected from the team overnight. I still lived with a couple of former swimmers, but we were all, you know, on the, on the last uh, uh, leg of our career. So I went to Frank and I said, Frank, listen, you know, I, I, when I was swimming, I noticed that we always had issues, you know, so many different moving pieces and you have limitations on coaches and, uh, you know, put me to work. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And uh, Frank said, okay, no problem, but you're going to be at every practice. I said, whoa, hang on a second. What do you mean? Every practice? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you know, I missed it. But I told him, okay, so, you know, let's go through till December and then, you know, I'm going to start removing myself maybe a little bit. But December comes around and Frank tells me, okay, well, this is going to be your group. And he gives me part of distance group. I said, okay, so what are they doing? He goes, no, it's your show now. <laughs> oh. now but that, that moment when we came back for uh, Christmas training was the moment when uh, it all clicked to me what I want to do. Um, I went to NC2As. Chad Carbon was a freshman. He got second in NC2As. All those things just hooked me, hooked me. Um, you know, the, what I was missing uh, in, in a couple of months uh, was training. But what I was missing is just that rush that you get, uh, uh, you know, with in practice, in the meets. Uh, and I wasn't getting it anymore. Uh, and needless to say, uh, you know, when, when I went to conference and NC2As and I saw swimmers that I partially helped do something special, um, it was like an onslaught of, of positive emotions, of fun. And I said, this is what I want to do. And, you know, I'll be grateful to Frank forever and ever because um, uh, he gave me my first opportunity, um, you know, as a volunteer. And then when position opened up, I walked into a full time position at the University of Arizona. Um, you know, the, nowadays you just can't do that anymore. Yeah, you know, it's that, that rush. Every every one of us here get that. I know Sid gets a rush when he sees kids go fast or a kid that he taught a flip turn uh, do well. Uh, Gary down at the race club when he teaches kids strokes. And by the way, if you haven't seen the race club videos, they're amazing. They're probably the best videos out there. Uh, you oh, need yeah. to go check it out. Let, but, um, put, Joe, can we put that uh, link up on our – in a, we can put it up right in the post yeah. of the box. Yeah, you, yeah best, can, best can put it up. But I mean, you know, it's it's the rush of seeing a kid that we all taught to do a stroke, to do a flip turn, to to race, do something at junior, senior, Olympic level. It's just it's it's the best rush in the world. So, Maria Schmidt, we all get you on that. That's for sure. Now, you coached a couple of colleges, right? We've been at what Oregon State. We've been at UM. Um, I started. Was, Oh yeah, Arizona. So what, what's the thought of, okay, you know, I'm, I'm done with college. I want to go to Pinecrest. How did that, how did that come about? Uh, you know what? It was, it was, a. Uh, um, I love my experience at Miami. Um, but, you know, looking back, it, you know, it wasn't, you know, what brought me to Miami? I, I, I did, you know, I thought I did very well at, at Oregon state. We had an old beat up pool. And we got into top 25 at NC2As with that. So, you know, what I wanted was a 50-meter pool. Um, you know, and Miami was going to give me that. But, you know, there were a lot of other things that, you know, that uh, didn't necessarily go the way that I wanted to. Um, in the meantime, my daughter is born. Um, you know, trying to recruit and do all the other things in college uh, is too difficult. Um, uh, you know, so when my contract was up and we were parting ways in Miami, uh, uh, you know, Jay, who, whom I'd known since I was in California, uh, uh, you know, swimming. Uh, Pretty Fitzgerald. Jay, yeah, he, he, he contacted me and said, you know, hey, listen, you know, I, I heard you might be looking for a, for a job and stuff. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another. And, you know, honestly, Pinecrest was going to be an experiment, you know, for a couple of years. That is now going on year number 16. <laughs> yeah. well you know what it's it, it was funny because i saw when i mentioned you and i saw sid smile and obviously sid was there uh, but, <laughs> well well yeah i mean marius i i had some of the challenge i had five great years at miami i loved it and it ended uh more abruptly than i probably planned but these things happen and i went forward from it and i had learned a lot and i would never regret loved being a cane 
Um, you know, I was also at Seminole. I was, it was, I was really conflicted that first football game. But the hard part for me at Miami, you get the 50 meter pool, but my years, they wouldn't let me kick the sunbathers out. And these girls were smoking cigarettes in string bikinis, and my boys really didn't want to swim too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so when I got, we only had steam. Kind of you know, you know, I can argue that when you bring on Friday evening, which was the prime bathing day time, when you bring guys on the pool deck, they might feel, okay, well, this is the place I want to go to school. But when you only call the women's team, you know, it's got to be all about athleticism and, and bringing, you know, our girls on a recruiting trip and you literally walking over sunbathers and you got people behind the blocks that you can't move, it becomes challenging. <laughs> Yeah, I, I bet. So there was a question on there by Bess, actually. She asked, any tips for coaching your own child? And I know that Marius, you coach yours. I know, Sid, you've coached yours. Gary, I know you've coached yours. So what, or, or been around that. So what, what's a, what's your 25 cent answer to all three of those things, that coaching your own kid? Because we have nine minutes left. I do want to get to Gary's book. Um, and I do want to follow up a little bit more with Marius. So go ahead, Marius, coaching your own kid. Actually, she's standing right here, so I got to be careful what I say. Bring her in. Bring her in. Yeah. Bring her in. Let's see. Hey. hey. <laughs> that she is a swimmer. swimmer. You can look at that girl. You can tell she's fast. I'm just she runs better than so. She just finished her run. Um, yeah. uh, it was it was beautiful. It was difficult. It was difficult to still transition. I have enjoyed my relationship, uh, and Danny Palmiotta did a phenomenal job with her. Um, I in January one this year when I started coaching her and I enjoy everything about being a dad and I made a point of not trying to be a coach at any point at a time. Um, but January one comes around, we had to deal with it. And January was very difficult because there was a lot, a lot of transitions. There were some cheer, tears, but one thing, and I've heard it from other people, other coaches, you know, one thing that we decided right away, I said, whatever issues we had, or whatever swimming related stuff we have, we're going to solve it before we leave the pool. So whether it was in the office, whether it was on a pool deck, once we walked out of that gate, I was dead and not a, not a word on swimming was going to be spoken. Um, and we're trying to keep those boundaries very clear um, because I, you know, I don't want to be home sitting at a dinner table and sure. having a fed athlete I'd better have an upset daughter that I can try to be dad to, or, you know, at least play one. Um, so uh, keeping the distance that, that I think that's very important. So Gary, I know that you've, uh, you dealt with your son a lot uh, at multiple Olympics. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and handling all that with him. Well, you know, actually, Joe, I feel uh, fortunate and I, I don't envy any uh, dad who has to be also a coach. It's a tough job just being a dad today uh and, and when you have to be the coach and the dad it's it's a really really hard uh thing to do and and, and marius is right you do you have to kind of make boundaries and separations but uh i was fortunate i mean uh mike bottom was the guy that really took gary um you know and, and they just had a great connection and once i discovered a coach that really bonded with gary and, and gary liked I knew that that was all I need to do. Just lead them to the right guy and, and the rest would happen. And, you know, same with my other kids. They were all great swimmers. They're all good or great swimmers, but um, I, I, I wanted to be a dad and I was in another life. I was a surgeon at the time. Uh, I, I was busy doing that. So I really didn't have time to coach, but I'm kind of glad the way it worked out. And I hope that if I have a chance to coach any of their children, which are my grandchildren, I would honor that. I would love that. I, that's a different role. That one I can handle. Actually, the kid that you said early on that could touch his toes standing there, that's the guy we need to talk to. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, yeah. don't just take him spearfishing, Gary. Let, let's get him doing some back uh, body we need that guy. All right, Sid, now, give us I did a see. Minute. I did see Tanya Hammond put in a little uh, sticker there for Mariush, and, and she saw firsthand being one of your assistant coaches for a long time. And, and I think, Marius, you do. Here, here's one tip. My wife made this rule when Quinn was coming up because when he was 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and I think it's easier. Gary might know because I, I, I coached my daughter a little bit, but she was really water polo. So very Quinn, it was doing a guy to a guy. 
it's probably a little easier, you know, having a daughter. I just know my issues being a dad is females different. But we had one rule. Leave it at the pool, just like you said. Any Unless Quinn brought up swimming at home, we didn't talk. I couldn't bring it up. Couldn't talk about relay order or splits, right? But once he brought it up, it was like, okay, On. we were allowed. You know, like I, I would I would let him lead the conversation. But it was, but overall, it was a joyous experience. I talked to Bob Matz and my mentor about it. You know, Gary, it is a challenge. And, and, and Joe, for all these guys, that's why Gary wrote us a book. So what do we got on it? Give us let's talk book. about the book. All right, give us yeah, give us give us the elevator uh, pitch, and then let's dive into this a little bit. So this book is what I call COVID therapy to keep me from going crazy. My and I owe this to my wife because um, like one or two weeks into this crazy quarantine, she saw I was just crazy. I was going nuts. I couldn't coach. The pools were closed. I was just and she said, well, you know, why don't you take all those articles you write for swim swim and just put them together make a book out of it. Uh, so I didn't really do that. I started out thinking I would do that, but it, I ended up writing a book called The Fundamentals of Fast Swimming. And it's really about technique, but it's it's more than that. It's kind of a compilation of a lot of what I've learned from. Uh, and you know, I acknowledge at the beginning of the book, the coaches that have have mentored me and tutored me through the years. And it was, it was like reading a Hall of Fame list and I can go through them starting from Rick Rowland, who just passed away just a few weeks ago, senior, uh, Lee Arth, John Urbanchek, Flip Dark, Gambrel, um, Peter Dalen, George Haynes, Doc, Councilman, Charlie Hickox. Uh, that's a who's who of coaching lists, you know, and, and I'm thinking, wow, uh, I've had some pretty amazing people influence me and help me to learn this sport. But this, this book is about swimming technique. And what I've learned was some really interesting technology and, and uh, always been a science guy, love technology. So I think it's pretty good. I've got Mike Bottom reviewing it and, and David Marsh reviewing it right now and I hope that if they don't, <clears throat> and I told them it's good for one of two things, it's either gonna help them be better coaches or it's gonna put them to sleep at night if they can't sleep. So one or the other will be good for them. But uh, uh, I think they like it. Uh, it'll be out in a few weeks, and we'll find out. Let the people read it and, and be the judges. Well, we'll, we'll definitely long. we'll we'll definitely put it up for sure. I uh, that's going to be Thank good you. to read. Definitely, I'm I'm psyched for it. Um, all right, so listen, we've got a couple of minutes left. Sid and I do this at every show. Um, you know, with your deep roots in swimming, and and again, we could talk to you guys forever, but with your deep roots in swimming and your knowledge about what's going on and training and coaching and being a dad and this whole entire pause that we have with training and the mental uh, craziness that's going on with our athletes, give us a 30 second, like, it's going to be okay. It's, you know, give us one of those, your, your, your thoughts on this whole craziness. Um, and I'll give you about 10 seconds while I talk to Sid. Sid, how you doing, bud? I'm letting them gain. I'm letting them get their thoughts together. You know, He's on I'll go first. I'll go first then. Uh, okay, go ahead, Marcus. <laughs> um, they muted you, Sid. They didn't want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, those boys are going to need more than 30 seconds to tell me. <laughs> no, man, they're, good. They're, they're brilliant. They can figure it out. They're brilliant. All right, Marius. You know, it is it is nothing more, nothing less than a, a, a tough moment in the middle of practice. When you look at your whole career, um, uh, you know, people are going to be swimming for 10, 12, 14, 16 years. Um, uh, you know, and if you look at practice, you know, you're always going to have that tough set and you're going to have a crisis or something that slips out of your control during the practice uh, and you can't continue for, you know, for a few minutes or for a few rounds, something happened, you got a cramp. Um, you know that it's going to be over. It's what you do at that moment um, to get you ready to get back in. It's what's going to make you better uh, in the long run. And I, you know, what, we, what we've been stressing to our kids is that the biggest thing that you need to do is to just create a sense of normality in this whole nonsense that goes on right now. Um, it's not a nonsense. I'm sorry to use the word. It's this whole craziness that's going on right now. Have a schedule. Have normal goals. Have normal challenges during the day. Create as much of a normality, and you're going to be better off coming out of it. 
That that makes a ton of sense. I just tell my kids, hey, look, frequency, like frequency. If 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 we were used to in the summer training twice a day, do something twice a day. Well, I don't care if you're skateboarding downtown. I don't, you know, do something twice a day and stick to it. All right, Gary, go ahead. So I tell all the race clubbers that come to me that you know I don't I don't call your uh, season a season. I call it a chapter. It's a chapter in your life, and you're writing your book of your life as you live it. He said, some of the chapters are not going to always go the way you think they're going to go. Uh, and, and sometimes they, they, things that, that happen that are beyond our control. But the bottom line is your chapters, your book is long, and there are a lot of chapters left in your life. And so, you know, if this chapter didn't quite end or start or, you know, come out the way you thought it was, it's okay. It's okay because you have so many more chapters. Having one go awry doesn't doesn't end, doesn't make the book a bad book. It just means that one kind of, you know, didn't ex- go the way expected. So, you know, this was a very short time in most people's career. And in some respects, getting away from swimming might not hurt in the long run. It might not be such a bad thing for people. Sid, these guys are so daggum wise, I can't stand it. All right. <laughs> well, give me, Sid, give me 10 seconds and then we'll say goodbye to everybody. I'm so thankful to have them both. Here's the deal, Joe. It's painful right now. It's going to change. We need to change. And it's a good pause. We look for the silver linings. We step back. We make the best of it. And that's what we do. We go forward. My son says, Make uh, those who come out of this time and have made the best of their time will be ahead of their time. Yeah, that's a- amen, well, amen, yeah. guys. Hey, listen, you guys are uh, you guys are awesome. I appreciate you guys coming on with us, and um, you know I, we'd love to have you back on so we can dive more into things. But um, appreciate your time, and uh, we will see you down the road. We have a lot of shows coming up. We have Sid next week on Monday. Uh, we do have. Uh, I, I, what I got you? national team uh, open water, former head coach Rick Walker, who coached many years at Southern Illinois, recently retired. National team coach and swimmer Marion B. Clark from a long time at University of Pittsburgh. And uh, maybe one more special guest. We're going to talk about how we got open water into the Olympics and some of those glory days of the 25K, amongst <laughs> other things, because Rick's experience at SIU, he's He's got, you know, lots and lots of stories. So that's right, well, that's Monday night, Joe. So thanks. All right. Well, listen, stay tuned, guys. And again, thank you guys very much. And we'll see you next time on Coaches thanks, Happy Sid. Hour. Thank you, Sid. Thank you, guys. Both. See you later. Join us on the Swim Monkey. Swim. Swim Monkey. 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 Swim Monkey.